All right. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, everybody, wherever you are in this world. Buenas noches, buenos días, buenas tardes. I want to say thank you to the Tia Chucha staff, in particular, Karen and Brian, for getting this together. And Ed and I are here due to the fact that Luis Rodriguez very generously offered to publish two different books of poetry. I had gone together with Luis uh, about two or three years ago, and I wanted him to write, and I've been working on this uh, translation um, anthology from Humberto Acabal for a number of years, and I wanted him to, to write a, a little blurb for the book. And after he looked at the poems, he goes, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to write an introduction. And I go, oh my God, what am I, what am I going to do? This is what I'm thinking. He goes, I want to publish the book, which left me floored. So through all the uh, trials and tribulations of the pandemic, here we are a couple of years later and being able to share this beautiful, gracious uh, book of poems with you. And at the same time, Ed, uh, Ed and I have been friends for many, many, many years about it. 10 years or so, but it feels like more like a lifetime because we have a lot of uh, root experiences in the world in common, including teachers. Uh, uh, my adopted grandfather was also one of Ed's teachers. So we have a lot of ceremonial background, even though we didn't know each other. We didn't meet till about 2010. But anyway, we are here uh, to share um, an evening of poetry with you. So I would like to say a few words about Ed. Um, Ed is an incredibly dedicated servant to life and, and, its, and, and its ways of being. So he's been dedicated to healing since the mid-70s as a therapist, primarily a Jungian therapist and analyst, and he started working with veterans. And so we met in 2010, I believe, and we got invited. To, he got invited to come to one of the men's retreats that I was a part of the staff of in Minnesota, and we've been kind of like uh, we realized that the enormity of the task at hand and being able to deal with the trauma, the trauma that was being brought home by the veterans, in particular in those years of Afghanistan and Iraq. And this goes even deeper than that because there's a lot of uh, world, world war, uh, worldwide conflicts that have, have not been mitigated or resolved in the minds of all those who participated in them. So Ed's work is dedicated to bringing healing to uh, all yeah. the people that served but also the people around them. So I give you a tick. Thank you, Miguel. Gracias, mi, mi hermano. Uh, good evening, everyone. But as Miguel said, buenas noches, buenos tardes. Uh, and uh, since I will be representing Vietnam and the Vietnamese, I also greet everybody with sin chao ban doi. Hello, greetings, my friends. Uh, as Miguel just shared, we honor Tia Chucha Press and Cultural Center for all of the really important work they've been doing in representing the uh, challenged and oppressed populations living here and abroad and bringing their literature into English and into our world. And again, as Miguel shared, uh, Louise has been extraordinarily generous to us. Um, Miguel asked for an introduction and got a book. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, I showed, uh, with Miguel's help, Miguel introduced me to Luis, and I thank you for that forever. Uh, and so I showed Luis a smaller book of poetry uh, on the Vietnamese women. And I put together a collection of their women's voices, and Luis said, uh, I don't want to publish this, because I know your work with the veterans. I know your books, War in the Soul and Warriors Return. I use them in my prison work for our incarcerated veterans. So give me everything, Ed. Tell me the veteran stories uh, back in Vietnam as well. And I have been writing my way through, I've been leading healing and reconciliation journeys to Vietnam for 20 years and writing my way through them with poetry. And so with Miguel's help and Louise's invitation, I put the whole thing together. So. My book coming home in Vietnam is a 20 year collection of my, my poems from those efforts. And those efforts came from our extraordinary devotion to finding every possible way to bring healing, homecoming, restoration, uh, and uh, closing up those terrible traumatic wounds that we all carry and we all share. Uh, so thank you again to Louise and Tia Chucha. And we both hope that we're helping extend Tia Chucha's mission. We're bringing the Vietnamese and the veterans in, as well as, um, of course, Guatemala and the Maya people. So bless Tia Chucha for being an international activist in 
writing and teaching in the cultural center. And as Miguel shared, we have been close friends, brothers, colleagues uh, for about a decade, but we have so much more in common. So I think we've been uh, brothers forever and just discovered it a decade ago. But uh, I'm so proud to introduce my beloved friend and brother, Miguel. Uh, tonight, Miguel is a poet and translator, but he is so much more than that. And some of you know that and uh, work with him. Miguel is a carrier of sacred medicine. He's an, uh, a world-class drummer. He's a mentor to the, to the youths and other challenged populations. Uh, he's been a leader at the Minnesota Men's Retreat for a long time. Miguel beautifully represents and preserves the legacy of our elders especially our grandfather, whom we mentioned, uh, Marcus Fairhart, and Robert Bly, who Miguel uh, more than worked closely with. Um, they passed the baton on to this wonderful man. And uh, now, with them being gone, um, Miguel is taking his rightful place in one of the seats that our elders have left behind. We are really concerned about legacy and us guys who are getting gray and white, especially so, and we want to, we need to preserve the legacy of our ancestors and teachers and pass on the lessons that they've given us. And so as a generous, loving, wise, delightful uh, leader, teacher, friend, um, Miguel is in an, a young elder seat now, and we hope you will be there for a long time guiding all of us together. So, Take your seat and everybody welcome and thank you for joining us. And we want to jump in to our poetry. Uh, I guess I'm leading off with a prayer. Yes. Uh, you've seen that the title of our evening's poet, uh, presentation tonight is the poetry of renewal, healing from colonization and war through poetry. We are respectfully, lovingly representing Two, po two countries, Guatemala and Vietnam, that have both had ancient histories with ancient peoples and deep old spiritual and cultural traditions that kept the people and the earth well for many, many centuries before invasions. Both of the, these countries have been in, severely invaded and colonized. Uh, Vietnam's been invaded for over 2,000 years. Uh, well, Guatemala did have indigenous conflicts before the, the white folks got here, but that Guatemala has been terribly uh, invaded and colonized and traumatized by the colonizations, by the invasions. So we want to represent these, these good people and share some of their wounds with you. But more importantly, we are devoted to healing, to renewal, to restoration, and so we want to share the poetry with you that come from these places and how our, the poetry sings from the hearts and souls of the people, uh, including the wounded, traumatized people, and guides us to healing. And poetry can be used as one of our principal healing tools. So with that, we'll jump in because uh, we want to share more poetry than talk. All right. Okay. So uh, we always begin and end in a sacred manner with prayer. And so I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to read a, a poem that opens my book, uh, Coming Home in Vietnam, called Praying. And I'll very briefly tell you the backstory. Uh, in this book, I tell stories of our veterans going back to Vietnam for healing and reconciliation. I tell stories of the Vietnamese people uh, some their veterans, their civilians, their children, and I write most of the poems, not all of them, but most of them in first person. So uh, what I'm using poetry to identify as deeply as possible with the people we're writing about, with the survivors, uh, so we can really feel our way into their hearts and souls and share the experience. And this poem is like that. It's called Praying. And it, it is in first person. The person who's reciting it is one of our veterans. There's two stanzas. The first stanza is how he was praying during a horrible firefight on his 19th birthday when he and his unit were attacked uh, 
by a suicide attack and they killed 300 enemy soldiers. They dug a mass grave and pushed all those bodies in. And our veteran has been haunted by that for decades and decades and wanted to go back to Vietnam and return the grave to the Vietnamese people. So the second stanza is praying again when we are back with the Vietnamese people and returning that grave to them and how they responded to it. So here we go. Our first poem for the evening, praying. Never in my life did I pray so hard as that day at the smoking bottom of this mountain among giant boulders and fallen trees when the enemy overran our wire and sprouted like berserk rice stalks no farther away than the, muzzle, than the length of my rifle and our muzzle holes became God's wrathful eyes. That was his battle on the 19th birthday. Now we're back, returning the grave. Never in my life did I pray so hard until today on the cloud crowned top of this mountain among smiling statues and wafting incense when their children took my hands and called me uncle and monks bowed to me as if I were a saint and I embraced their dead as my true brothers and God's loving eyes gazed through my torn and mending heart. Briefly, the aftermath. After this trip back, our veterans' nightmares stopped. No more. His guilt stopped. His moral wound was healed. And he kept going back to Vietnam himself after this trip. He went back three times. He met a, a Vietnamese woman. He fell in love with her. They got married. And now they live together in both countries. So they have truly become two yeah. countries who once were enemies have become one through this love union. And this is one of the beautiful visions of reconciliation that can happen from this kind of work. What's really uh, important to recognize here is a return to using the earth, some sort of relationship as a calibration tool to take you from the personal feeling experience or, or emotional experience back into some reconfiguration where you can go back to source and put yourself back back from the beginning again. So this is Ed and I, when we were planning this, I said, I've will. I, I, I read his list of what he wanted to read and, and this was the complimentary poem for that one. It's called The Answer. Open up the earth with your hands, get filled with its scent. Raise your face to the sky and eat the wind. That is peace, the grandmother said. That is peace, the grandmother said. So it's an invitation really to return to the source, which is what uh, our friend here was doing, going back to source. So anyway, <laughs> I pass it back to you. Thank you, gracias. Uh, Miguel and I are, oh, I wanna mention for those who don't know that Miguel is the translator and the second poet of his collection because uh, Umberto Acapal is the original poet and the poems were written in Maya, in Quiche, and translated into Spanish and then translated into English. So there's three languages represented in Miguel's poetry. And that also is uh, bringing together our our fractured world into one united effort. And so thank you, Miguel, for all the people you represent. And in that spirit, uh, Miguel and I had a, a dear brother, friend, colleague uh, named Roger Schurz, who is a uh, who is um, Native American. He's a uh, uh, Salish warrior. He was a Marine. He lived on the um, Flathead Reservation in Montana. Uh, he came back to Vietnam with me. Uh, he came to many of our retreats. He helped us lead the retreats. He brought Native American ceremony to our men's retreats and our veteran retreats. And we love him very much. And he's one of our ancestors now. He passed a few months ago. And so I wanna read a poem uh, about one of my experiences with him, but also in honor and memory of him. And some of the work we're doing is of course, sharing our grief and using uh, our poetry to heal it. 
So this poem is called The Bear Hug because Roger's native name, Nupkus, is Seize the Bear. And he was a big, strong bear. Uh, this poem is going to demonstrate to you, um, going to demonstrate to you some of the challenges and wounds that our warriors carry and carry uh, forever because of their experiences in combat. Uh, there's one word in Vietnamese that you need to know. Um, probably you, many of you know it already because lots of Americans love to eat uh, what looks like it's pronounced as pho, P-H-O. It's pho in Vietnamese, but Americans say pho, which is a pun, uh, of course, on the, the word pho, enemy. So that's the last word in the poem, but you need to know it has the double meaning to get it. So there, Roger and I are um, communing in Vietnam. And this is the poem. And the words are his. It's true, grunted the old Marine as his log thick forearm circled my neck. Closer than a wife, he cooed and yanked my head uh, against his. Deeper than sex, he said, and his free hand rolled into the same grip that he had grasped the hilt of his honed K-bar blade, reversed and hidden against his forearm. How could I marry like this, he asked, as he whipped his hand in the, uh, the air across my throat with the same fierce caress of the invisible blade along the soft brown skinned throats of those he had hugged on these white and blood stained sands centuries ago. You see how combat remains with people, even in their body, even in their movements. So he hugged me like that. And then he released my neck. Was it a grunt or a laugh? If we were sitting in a restaurant and we turned together toward the coming of the pho, not the pho, toward the coming of the pho. So after that demonstration that of how war remains with him and why it's so hard to be intimate, we were intimate. And that was an act of love to share that with me in a peaceful way that didn't harm. Bless you, Rogers. <laughs> Rest in peace, be with us. Yeah. And so the first, um, when Roger crossed over last year, it left a huge void in our lives. I was stunned for days. I could not, <laughs> we didn't know, we didn't know each other for very long, but he had a tremendous impact, not only on my life, but on Ed's life, because Ed knew him longer than, than, than me. But uh, we got into so, such incredible spaces together. And so, I want to read this one in, in, in out, of, um, out of out of love for him. There are moments. There are moments in life when tears are not capable of freeing the pain in the heart of the one who goes or the one who stays. When tears are not capable of freeing the pain in the heart of the one who goes or the one who stays. And what's important here is the gift that was brought to us by Roger. You know, years and years and years of dealing with uh, antagonism by non non native folks in his reservation, outside of the reservation, and yet still, I mean, our teacher um, 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 Ed mentioned his name. You know, Mr. Williams, Marcellus Williams. You know, he was like that. He goes, "Don't you think it's hard for me?" hang out with people that are not natives but he said we have a we have a job to do and the, the job is to change the legacy of colonization of colonialism how do we do it you know, people talk about this all the time but uh, what i feel is really important is we have to learn each other's customs each other's songs each other's dances each other's foods how we are with the earth and share that teach each other the ways of, of reciprocity not only with each other but with the earth itself. And so this is what these men were doing and spending time with us, allowing us to uncouple from the legacy of Columbus and all the other ones that went around creating mayhem around the globe. So uh, that's part of the process, learning, understanding how to be creative with what, what we're given. And I'll share even uh, building on what Miguel just shared, going to the places, uh, 
we have the phrase returning to the scene of the crime. Uh, there, so many of our veterans feel utterly heartbroken, destroyed, shattered because they were agents of colonization. They were agents of colonization. The Vietnamese, uh, they don't call it uh, that war, the Vietnam War, of course. They can call it the American War, but more commonly, they call it the last anti-colonial war. For 2,000 years, these people have been invaded and occupied by much larger, more powerful countries, especially China, Japan, uh, France, and then the United States. So we were the last colonial power to invade there and try to control that. And, and Vietnam belongs to them now. But going back there in friendship, uh, and we do very much charity, uh, philanthropic work over there. We've built two schools. We help Agent Orange victims. Uh, we help feed uh, really impoverished villages. Uh, doing this work demonstrates our love and friendship and also brings uh, healing to our veterans. Uh, the Viet they, when we're over there, they're always, always ask the Vietnamese for forgiveness. And the Vietnamese always say, there's nothing to forgive. You were good warriors doing what warriors should do when their country demands it. You didn't know it was wrong. You didn't decide to come here. The only people we have any issues with are your government and corporations who sent you here. But we honor you as good, honorable, noble warriors. They're shocked to hear that. They feel going over, they're afraid they're gonna be treated like criminals. And instead they're treated, that's what we, the first poem said, like uh, saints who have returned to bring back the spirit and restore the land and the people. So going to where it hurt and where we caused so much pain and being with the people there uh, and healing and, and praying uh, is really important. And we all know about uh, Kim Fook, the girl who became famous because she's the girl who was run, had been napalmed and uh, running from the na naked and burning from the napalm. And that picture went all over the world. Well, we go there. We um, uh, we visit her home. Her br well, her brother died a few years ago, but we used to uh, have coffee with her brother in their family home. And uh, the napalm attack happened right outside their home. She was running up the road, trying to get away from the napalm uh, in between our home and a church, the pagoda, when she was hit. This poem is called Where Fire Rained. And it's also in memory of one of our veterans named Jim Helt, who was in our Air Force and Jim suffered Agent Orange poisoning and he died a few years ago um, from Agent Orange cancers. Uh, he had some of our warrior brothers bring his ashes back to Vietnam to scatter them there under a giant statue of Quan, Quan Yin, the goddess of mercy. But uh, Jim and I went back to Vietnam and we were right there where Kim Phuc was uh, napalmed. And so this is to him and to her right there. And this is also, as Miguel says, about healing the earth with our love and our prayer. So where fire burned, where fire rained. Before the blue and yellow temple where fire rained on children from the steel birds he once helped steer. The gray grizzled vet plants his sandals in the shadowy footprints of the fleeing, frying girl. He shuts his eyelids tight to take leave of sunlight, bicycles, and buffalo. In his darkness, he sees red, only red, everywhere bright, hot, red. The elements, too, have souls. He answers the ghost of fire in the only way he can. He bows his head and prays. I'm going to take a breath on that one. But what's important to realize here is that uh, we have to also, um, in a way, re-sanctify the elements. We have to uh, a basic relationship with fire. Fire is also a very holy thing. 
it's not just a metaphor, it's not, it's not an idea, but it's also really living, breathing, and it's getting used for negative purposes, but it's also transformative, and it's vital to our existence, so we have to have it. So there's a way of looking at that fire and also reconfiguring, so we can look at the fire also as a, as a, as a changing dynamic element that also brings life, right? So I'm going to read this one. Uh, El fuego acuclillado apaga la tristeza del leño cantándolos, cantándole su ardiente canción y el leño le escucha consumiéndose hasta olvidar que fue árbol. The fire, the fire crouching eases the sadness of the log by singing to him his burning song. And the log listens, consuming himself until he forgets that he once was a tree. Ah, oh, I love that poem. Uh, obviously, so much of this work is about recognizing and healing the grief that we have caused, that we've left behind other people's losses, our losses, the earth's losses. And uh, many of our veterans go back to Vietnam for that purpose. They want to recover what they left behind. So uh, this poem is called Recovering Ronnie. And this is a story, it's a haiku series. Um, it's a, the story of uh, one of our veterans seeking uh, his, his battle buddy's uh, death site. And it was in the Mekong Delta in a very remote place. It was really hard to find. Um, so the story of how we found it is in here also. The Vietnamese are always welcoming and grateful for us to come back and go way out of their way to help us uh, locate these sites and complete our grief. And when we do ceremony on the death sites, uh, they, they come out of everywhere we do, um, to, to join us and to pray with us. Even if they can't speak English, they know what we're doing. They feel it. And they take incense and they bow and pray with us. So this is called Recovering Ronnie. And again, this is in first person in the words of our veteran who went back to find him. And Ronnie was his battle buddy's first name. All right, so we are seeking the death site. And he... He's looking around at the Vietnamese, and this is where it starts. His fishing line falls into murky green waters, my old ambush bridge. Among thick leaves, buffalo farms, and old tombs, where did we live and die? How could I know it was this littered mud lane and the smiling Buddha? Rows of wet patties covering my old fire base, just bitter melon vines. The young farmer pointing to his grandfather's fields, your tanks, our melons. Sobbing sad taps into my old harmonica, distant sutra chanting. Half a century to bring his soul home, shrapnel in my heart. Shrapnel and sorrow, Vietnam in my body. We are always one. She wraps small brown arms around my heavy white frame. We love you. 50 years for this one moment together again. Wow. And um, I had met Umberto in 1995 or so. Uh, and uh, after we had a cafe, we had lunch at a cafe in uh, downtown Guatemala City, he agreed. Uh, he would say, I will, I asked him for permission to do the first anthology. And he said, yeah, I will let me, let me go ask permission from my elders. And so about, um, a month back, I got a fax from him, <laughs> and it was very brief, and it said, the fire said yes. So that was the answer. So 
we spent about four or five years working on the first anthology. And so we brought him to the United States in 2001. And his first trip was uh, to the Great Mother Conference in uh, Maine in, in May. And then in September, we went to uh, Minneapolis, right? Of course, September 11th happens in the whole shebang with the, with the towers. So at the end of the retreat, uh, a lot of stuff came up, uh, which sometime I'll tell the rest of the story. But at the end of the retreat, Robert goes, hey, let's go out and have some, f- let's go have some food and talk about the retreat. And I know a great soup place. That's all he said. So it, it happens. So we get there, and it's a Vietnamese restaurant, and we're eating pho, right? Or pho. Right. And so, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, in my mind, you know, 25 years ago, we were bombing the crap out of each other with Vietnam, you know, thinking about it. And then I look outside the restaurant, and across the way, there's a German food restaurant. And I said, 50 years ago, we were bombing the crap out of each other with the, with the Germans. And here we are today. We just had this huge event happen in New York City. Again, a bomb, another bombing. And, and, I'm say, and I'm thinking in my mind, what ancestral legacy are we not taking care of that we have to go through these incredible ordeals with all this bloodshed to just to get to eat each other's food? You know, I mean, the reality, here we are, and here we are 25 years later and enjoying it and the same thing. So I'm thinking, we're, we got this backwards. You know, we should start eating, each other, start eating each other's foods first before we get into any kind of a battle or a fight. So we have to reconsider what the, what the ancestral legacy is, you know. So when that, in reading this, this is what I want to counter with. Uh, this is called Light and Shadow. And uh, Umberto was invited. He traveled. He was very well known in Europe. He spent time in Switzerland, France, Italy, Spain, uh, Austria, and they loved him over there. And he, he was well known in, in, uh, throughout South America and Japan too as well. And so he wrote a series of poems in Venice, and this is one that was written in Venice, but it reminded me of this because there's an essence in here. That, and like I said, we'll, we'll say this over and over again throughout the evening, but it's important to remember that we have to recalibrate by just stopping, period and seeing what it needs to be seen instead of trying to weigh, right, or fix it or create more polemics or more uh, uh, more antagonism, you know. So, so we'll figure it out. Anyway, light and shadow. I cannot separate myself from the memory. We, will walk, we walk like the light and the shadow. If I threw him into the ocean, he would never drown because his heart is of water and his waves would be bigger each time. If I buried him in the ground, he would sprout again. He is seed. He is semen. If I threw him into the wind, his flight would be eternal. He is bird, his wings spanning from dawn to dusk. And if I threw him into the fire, his flames could not touch him, for he is also fire and burn. The memory goes on in front, and I am behind. If the, if the memory dies, the future will also die. Light and shadow. This is for running in that way, you know, to, to recover, to go back and recalibrate. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. And uh, would you please, uh, that's from the, the, the first book of his. Would you please tell our friends about oh. that? Oh, yeah. So well, this one is beautiful. And- uh, the first one was published by uh, Robert Bly's uh, Ally Press, in uh, it was called Poems Are Brought Down from the Mountain. And this one is actually. Luis's Tia Chucha's press, Luis's endeavor into the uh, in the courtyard of the moon. So, if you're into it, just send us a text or an email. We'll figure out because they're both beautiful, beautiful books, and they got a lot. There's a lot of information here, a lot of treasures, a lot of seeds to ponder. Yes, amen to that. They really are beautiful books, among my favorite in my poetry collection and library. So uh, I'm going to read a bit of a longer poem, but this is an important story. Uh, The poem I'm going to read now uh, is called Point of View. And by far, this is the favorite poem of veterans and military in my book. And I'll tell you why. Um, Every year, another elder who has recently passed, his name was Nguyen Tom Ho, he was known as Mr. Tiger. uh, And uh, we visited with him every year in the Mekong Delta. Mr. Tiger was in his 80s and his 90s when we visited him. Uh, He died two two years ago. Um, And he was considered one of the wise elders. They called him the Ho Chi Minh of the Mekong Delta. He looked like it, he had the long scraggly beard. 
Mr. Tiger was at war for 25 years. Not, he was never in the military. He was always Viet Minh and Viet Cong, which are the local militia, uh, like equivalent to the American Minutemen of the, of the revolution. They're, they supply their own weapons. They just, you know, famously wore black pajamas because they were cheap and easy to get. Um, and they had to carry their own food and they were just local people defending their homes and their families, their villages, um, and trying to stop the invasion. So we've visited with Mr. Tiger every year. Uh, one of our veterans said to him, Mr. Tiger, you must have terrible survivor guilt. You were at war for 25 years. You must, and the wars were here. You must have lost so many people. Don't you feel guilty for surviving like we do? We, uh, we American veterans are riddled with survivor's guilt. And Mr. Tiger gently smiled and said, oh, my friend, I invite you to feel sorrow, not survivor's guilt. Or don't you feel guilty for surviving, Mr. Tiger? No, I'm sad about the losses on both sides, but I don't feel guilty. And then he said, this is so deep wisdom we don't have on this side of the world. Mr. Tiger's answer was, Perhaps the bullet is the messenger of karma. We must learn to see our lives from the point of view of the bullet. So this poem is called Point of View, dedicated to Mr. Tiger. And our warriors really love this poem because it helps them recalibrate their own thinking and feeling and how they can carry the grief and the sorrow and the pain uh, from the wars. So from the point of view of the bullet, one will live, one will die. From the point of view of a man, my life is his death. From the point of view of the bullet, you took the right step, he the wrong. From the point of view of a man, his death should have been mine. From the point of view of the bullet, fate is a swift, straight shot. From the point of view of a man, fate is a fickle whore. From the point of view of the bullet, I am a servant of destiny. From the point of view of a man, destiny is a greedy whore. From the point of view of the bullet, his destiny was complete. From the point of view of a man, he left me to live for two. From the point of view of the bullet, you survived to finish your mission. From the point of view of the man, I wish I had died instead. From the point of view of the bullet, your service was not your mission. From the point of view of the man, my time in hell was enough. From the point of view of the bullet, life wants more from you. From the point of view of a man, Tell me what I must do. From the point of view of the bullet, live for all who died. From the point of view of a man, too many lamenting ghosts. From the point of view of the bullet, their voices are now your voice. From the point of view of a man, those voices are now my voice. I have to let that one breathe for a moment, you know. I think um, what it does for me, it brings up an incredible amount of grief, you know. And I think what's important is to realize that the grief has to be shared. The grief has to be given. And it has to be given back to the earth. I think that's one of the things that we forget is how to be reciprocal with the earth. And I think if there's one thing that we're being taught, especially with these old teachers, especially like talking about um, Marcellus, that uh, he encouraged us and whatever we did to always talk story to the earth, you know, and it's not okay to suppress it. It's not okay to take it out on yourself or somebody else, but it's what's important is to give it. And the ultimate transformer of everything is the earth. The earth where the medicine is, you know. So in this case, at the invitation, uh, I remember last, uh, when the George Floyd verdicts came out uh, last year, and uh, that was part of a, on a, 
Zoom group uh, meeting. And the, the level of grief that was present in the roof was really palpable. And I was happy for that because to me, that's important. And especially with the level of uh, anxiety and challenge that we have right now in, in the earth right now, especially in this country, it's important to acknowledge it and not just bury it or, or, or cover it with a coat of paint or move on to the next thing, but just to stop and to actually feel it, really feel the grief. And the, and the grief is, is, there's old griefs here that go back centuries, I think, in some cases, you know. So this is what I thought about when you went. I've loved that. I've loved that poem since the first time I heard it about twelve years ago. Whenever that was, you know. So I'm glad you shared that. This is called the rain. When it rains at night, the flowers go out for a stroll. The trees talk about their concerns, things from long ago, and they weep. When it rains at night, the flowers go out for a stroll. The trees talk about their concerns things from long ago and they weep yeah. Yeah. The, the vietnamese have a missing a, a holiday for their missing in action we still have about two thousand uh the vietnamese have a quarter million the war was so horrible over there uh, that comes back to me right now because um, the holidays in September and it's on the September full moon and they say that is the day the moon cries its tears. So we remember our missing on the day the moon cries its tears. Beautiful. That was the one thing I, I, I remember. Um, I, I came to the United States in 1966, right? And and at that point, the, every night, every newscast, but they, they they would at the end they would say the casualty rates, you know, so many killed, so many wounded from both sides, and and, I, and it was always about ten to one, you know. And I'm thinking, aren't these lives aren't the, isn't the value of life the same? It doesn't matter where you are from this planet. So that was always uh, in the back of my mind, you know. It's just because they're Vietnamese doesn't mean that they're they're worth any less, you know. So we have to consider that too. So I'm glad you brought that up. It's an important thing to consider, you know. Yeah, thank you. And yeah. um, with that observation, I'm going to switch um, and read some poems about the Vietnamese experience from their, their side and what they went through. Another part of our healing for the planet is to get the other people's experiences. In America, well, we're somewhat concerned about our warriors and our veterans, but mostly it's Hollywood and mostly it's war stories and ad the adrenaline rush of that. We're not concerned about the healing stories. We're not concerned about the way their families are suffering. And we don't know the people against whom we went to war. We don't even know why. Um, and so our warriors and all, all of us going back to Vietnam, meeting the people, gathering their stories, sitting in solidarity and everybody sharing stories together is extraordinarily important. And their stories uh, are amazing and fascinating. And we also see that they were making war. Uh, it had to be brutal. It was war and we were invading their country. And at the same time, they were making war in a different way than we were. So. This one is, uh, was a Vietnamese family story. Um, the, the farmer who lived this story told it to me. Uh, so this poem is called First Meeting. And uh, this story is from the Northern countryside. So, uh, well, he made our plains. We didn't meet our people on the ground. First Meeting. I saw the steel bird fall from the sky. Wings on fire, a phoenix dying. Beneath a silken cloud and spider strands, only a boy floated to earth. Through the smoke of our burning grasses, I looked into his rolling eyes, his bloodied face, trembling hands. He too had a mother in grief. He too had a mother in grief. I laid down my scythe. I fed him some rice. I washed him. I wrapped his torn skin. Then I sent him in an ox cart to Hanoi. During the war, Ho Chi Minh preached to the Vietnamese people 
try not to kill the Americans. If you can, take them prisoner so we can send them home later. They, too, have families in grief. They, too, have mothers crying for them. They, too, don't want to be here at war. They, too, the American GIs here trying to fight us and kill us are also victims of this war. So they had a completely different attitude toward us, even though they were fierce fighters and they had to be. And Buddhism also teaches that the Vietnamese are predominantly Buddhist. Buddhism doesn't teach that war is wrong, it teaches that war is tragic, a tragic, a, a, sometimes a necessity to preserve our own lives. So try not to do it and do everything you can before, during, after to preserve life. And the Vietnamese really did fight that way. Mr. Tiger, uh, whose point of view poem, um, he was also well known uh, in the Mekong Delta for when some Americans were captured and some Viet Cong wanted to hurt them, torture them, maybe even execute them, Mr. Tiger stopped them. He saved American lives. He said, when they're armed and fighting us, us, of course we have to fight back, of course. But when there are prisoners and unarmed, they become our guests and we have to take care of them. Totally different way of war than our way. To you, Miga. <laughs> and again, uh, this is interesting how we reclaim our humanity, right? Our, our participation with the world. So this is the one that I thought about. That one shadow. The shadow of that walnut leaf walks on the wall like a bat looking for darkness under the roof of the house. Over the hill, the sun ages a little. The shadow of that walnut leaf walks on the wall like a bat looking for darkness under the roof of the house. Over the hill, the sun ages little by little. Beautiful, thank you. Another story of the Vietnamese. Uh, we've all heard of the demilitarized zone, which was the no man's land in between Old North and South Vietnam, right along um, the river. And so the Northern forces were on one side of the river, the Southern and Americans on the other, and families and communities that had lived together, been together for, uh, for hundreds of years were suddenly separated and couldn't communicate anymore. I love this poem. This is a really creative story of how one Vietnamese family that had been divided by the war um, stayed connected and communicated. Uh, again, this was told me by the family that lived this. So this poem is called The Kite. Monsoons of burning metal scalded our next harvest. We could not eat ash. I saw my family across the river. Their rice was ashen too. We could not meet, could not help each other, could not even send a message through the blazing muscles lining both banks. A postcard took a year and traveled through half a dozen countries just to say, I'm alive. I miss you. Please be well. Finally, I made a rice paper dragon, tied it to a long string, hung a note from its talons. Dragon floated on currents above the brown waters. Dragon dodged and ducked burning missiles. Dragon floated above my parents' hut. Then I cut the string. Dragon tumbled home. In this way, Though the powers denied us, Dragon, Wind, and I wished my weary aging parents Chuck Moon Namoy, Happy New Year. Beautiful. Yeah. So I'm going to read this one in three languages. Uh, Ed talked earlier about uh, Quiche, how these, a lot of the Guatemala poems are all written in Quiche. Humberto translated them to Spanish, and then I did the English version, sometimes with help with Robert Bly and sometimes with Fran Quinn. This one was uh, with friends, Fran Quinn's uh, help, the English version. Mukunahik, 
Shin woke rinutat arejampa shin warahri u kamina kil. Shinokik arejampa shuyakan ri rachoch. Are kuch kaham ri be chorrihum. Chila shinch abeg kanok. Shin ban ribis are shin kastahik pa nume bayil. Shui nukutel chik shin we tamaj. Che we hun ukutel kakanahik. Raja washkik kumuk kanok konohel ri keshkegol rimam katoptah re che shidik ri ukaslemal hum. Enterrado. Lloré a mi padre mientras velaba su cadáver. Lo lloré cuando el féretro salió de la casa camino al cementerio e y le dije adiós. Hice el duelo. Y al amanecer en mi orfandad, me vi solo y comprendí que para vivir solo necesitaba dejar enterrado con él todo el dolor que me impidiera seguir viviendo. Buried. I wept for my father during his wake. I wept when the coffin went out of the house on the way to the cemetery, and there I said goodbye. I mourned, and when I awoke as an orphan, I saw myself alone and understood that to, li that to live, I only needed to leave buried with him all the pain that could stop me from living. That I needed, that I saw myself alone and understood that to live, I only needed to leave buried with him all the pain that could stop me from living. So. Yeah, thank you. And this poem is about the same thing. Of course, on many trips to Vietnam, we visit My Lai, the site of the worst atrocity of the American war, when we, Charlie Company, massacred 504 innocent uh, civilians, women, children, and oldsters. Uh, so we have visited My Lai many times. Um, this is a short poem, just a short haiku series, but I really want you to absorb the last stanza and this lesson. It's really about what Miguel just shared about lying, uh, finally burying our grief and how we can do that. And what can we trend? How can we transform this monstrous grief that we carry? Uh, so this poem is called The Gardener. And the speaker is a 90 year old massacre survivor. She's the only one of his, her family that survived. She lost her parents, her husband, her children. And she said to me, uh, you know, in Vietnam, family is everything to us. So without family, um, life is empty and terribly painful. Oh, mother, how has it been for you since that day? She said, I wish I had died with them in the massacre. It would have been easier than living on without them. But that's not the last word. So this poem is for her and for all of those, all of those beautiful people. The gardener. Bright-eyed boy playing peekaboo on my mother's grave. Beyond the ditch where my daughters died, new green rice. She was a gardener. She only had an old rusty pair of scissors for her tools. Each snip of my rusty scissors, a gun blast. What can we do? I asked her, grandmother, what can we do to help you heal? You wish to help me heal? Please, let me forgive you. She said to me, after this long, difficult, sad life, I finally come to understand that the reason I survived that massacre and lived this long life was so that I could meet American veterans and, and take their hands and look into their eyes and forgive them and help them be well again. Hmm. 
This is what I came up with when I, when I read that one. One door. My heart has only one door and it opens from the outside. <laughs> My heart has only one door and it opens from the outside. I, I have to say, uh, <laughs> and, and sometime around 2003, I was at a book for a book fair here in LA, trying to sell the first collection of books and uh, first collection of Umberto's poetry. And uh, a woman came to the booth where I was, and I was. It was. It was. Somehow, I got stuck between. Uh, it was. We were sharing each booth. It was divided into three. And where I was, I had a travel agency on one side and a, a funeral services on the other side, and I was in between. And they were both independent businesses, but they were both run by the Catholic Church, you know. So I was thinking, wow, interesting, <laughs> funeral services and travel agency, right? But here I was in, the, in between these two. It's part of a larger story. But anyway, the woman looked at the books. 20 minutes, she kept looking at the books, and finally she said, these poems are way too short. I said, you can't buy the book. I won't sell you the book. <laughs> You're not going to understand them. <laughs> You're not going to understand them. So uh, I have to take a, a moment here and just remind everybody that these books are available through the Tia Chucha's website. And it's really important to support the the small press. The Ed's book, Coming Home in Vietnam, and, my, and the Umberto's book, uh, that's my translations, in the Courtyard of the Moon are available uh, through the website Tia Chucha, tiachucha.org. So please order the books. It would be great. Support your local book so your bookseller. They're like an enclave of culture. That's the way I look at them. They're like a, a little enclave of guard, fierce guardians of the people for the the well being of the people. Anyway, so I pass it to you, Ed. Yes, thank you for that, Miguel. And uh, in our kind of society, we do vote with our money. So who we give our money to really matters. It it is true that if you buy our books through Tia Chucha, you'll pay. Two or three dollars more than on Amazon, and you will be supporting a major, important small press, and you will be supporting a cultural center that is working to help bring reconciliation and healing for many, uh, so many of our different ethnic groups. So, vote with your money and buy our books and buy them from Tia Chucha. <laughs> and. Uh, Please believe us, Miguel and I don't get rich off poetry. <laughs> the rich, it's, it's 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 the richest of the heart, the flowering heart. That's the heart. That's the it's the love. It's the love, right? So, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so here's a love poem. <laughs> uh, and uh, this poem is for uh, another one of uh, the Viet Cong veterans. His name is Tom Tien. He lives in the Mekong Delta, and. Uh, I met it, well, I've led 20 healing and reconciliation journeys back to Vietnam. They only stopped because the pandemic stopped culture. Uh, I mean, travel, sorry. <laughs> it tried to stop culture. <laughs> uh, but a lot of us rose up and kept culture going, uh, in, uh, especially during uh, this uh, shutdown and isolation time. Uh, so um, Tom Tien was a Viet Cong veteran. Uh, he... Uh, he was nearly killed. He was left for dead after a battle with American forces. He was wounded so badly. He has an absolutely miraculous story of survival. Um, and he was shot open and he held himself together and crawled for hours and hours and hours through the jungle until he could find somebody to, um, to help him. And he did finally recover. Uh, so uh, we've all heard um, about about the tunnels in Vietnam that the Viet Cong uh, in the North Vietnamese use sometimes. Uh, and especially in the South, Tom Tien was in the tunnels sometimes. And uh, the, to support the help themselves, the Viet Cong, of course, uh, everybody has dark humor, fox humor. They called their soldiers who would pop up through a spider hole from the tunnels in, onto an American base, they would say, well, you're a flower that bloomed inside the enemy. You're the flower that bloomed inside the enemy. And so Tom Tien was one of these. He is so loving. He's Now, Miguel is a great, happy, energetic person, and I love hanging with him because it makes me happy. 
but sorry, Miguel, Tom Tien is the happiest person I've ever known in my life. Yeah, he, he thinks he shouldn't have been here. He was so close to death and his survival is so miraculous. He has the most beautiful laugh I've ever heard. And, uh, and he hosts us all the time. Uh, every trip we stay in his little compound in the Mekong Delta right on the river. And, uh, and he tends us. Uh, he makes friends with our veterans. He makes sure. First time I met him, he told us, oh, I got to tell you the story. Forgive me for taking too much time now, but this is wonderful. All right. So first time I met him was I began leading these journeys in 2000. So I met him in 2001. We were in a, uh, I was with a group of about eight veterans and we were uh, puttering across the Mekong River to his little compound on an island. We got to his little dock and he came running up in pajamas, really not black pajamas, but he was really in his pajamas. And he just came running up to the edge of the water before we even climbed out of the boat. And he pulled up his shirt and he had horrible scars across his chest and in his side. He really did have what the, the warriors call uh, the gut sucking wound that usually kills people, but he held himself together. So he pulled up his shirt, he's pointed to his scars, and he laughed and he said, ha, 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 look, my friends, you almost killed me. And if I had died that day, we wouldn't have lived to this wonderful day where we could all meet and become friends. Isn't that funny? <laughs> uh, our vets were really scared. Is he mocking us or welcoming us? Is this real? Well, he escorted us into his home. He gave us a, a luncheon feast. He told us his whole story of survival, and then he went around the circle and made every American veteran tell their story. They couldn't believe a Viet Cong veteran wanted to know their experience, but he smiled again and said, I have to know if we ever met before under different circumstances. And uh, warriors who once were in battle with each other love um, to meet and to reconcile and to tease each other. Ha, ha, ha. Good thing you were a bad shot, so I'm still here. Yeah, well, you were a bad shot too. We both missed. Well, that not that good? Yeah. All right. So he hosts us with beautiful, beautifully and lovingly, uh, and we stay in his compound. And so this is for Tom Tien, flowers blooming inside the enemy. Once you were the flower that blossomed on my base, your petals spit fire. Your leaves blazed hate. Your spider webbed face taught me how to fear. Today you are the flower that blossoms on this river. Your petals drip kindness. Your leaves caress mine. My lost years fade to nothing as you teach me again to love. Yep. What was it? Uh, uh, a favorite quote of mine these days is uh, Stevie Wonder. He says, "Turn your words into truth, and then turn that truth into love." And this is what we're. This is the necessity. People go, "Well, love, love is the answer." Yeah, but what does that really mean? And I think you have to go through the recognizing the pain. You know, they ain't, there's anger and there's fear there because there's pain, and 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 there's pain there because something happened to the love. You know, to that that state of the holy. You know. So we have to go back and reclaim that. And how do we get there? That's this tricky territory, right? That, that old quote of uh, the map is not the territory. So we're in the territory now because then we have to get rid of the maps that we've been given. So we're re-examining. We have to be okay with just being in the territory and not having to necessarily figure it out, but stopping, just stopping for a moment, right? And really seeing what's there, what needs to be seen. And the mystery has no, um, that's one of the things that our teacher, again, used to be really emphatic about. Pay attention. Be alert. This is, will not, it will never be the same way again, but be, because it's always there. He's, don't ever be a Methodist, you know, always be aware to see how it's, and so it's going to be different each time. But you have to be open to how it shows, how it, how it, how it shows up, you know. So this one's called Song. The Grandfather takes his grandson by the hand to greet the trees, 
talk to them, feel their skin, smell their leaves, and the trees sing their names. And the trees sing their names. And if we really listen, we hear the singing. Beautiful, thank you. We have about 20 minutes left and Miguel and I have many more poems to share and stories to share, but I just wanna pause and take a deep breath. We know there's about 20 of you out there on different forms of uh, media and we do invite questions or comments or stories of yours. So I'm just checking in and asking uh, while we have time, any questions or comments out there that anybody wants to share before we read more poems? Okay, seems like not right now, but <laughs> <laughs> we're happy to keep reading to you. Thank you yeah, for, yeah. The, for the time in this space. But really, if you have anything to say along the way, uh, please do. Don't be shy about it. Uh, so, hmm. thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, so as Miguel just shared, and we keep sharing, sharing the grief is critical, making the stories of grief our shared stories, rather than American stories, Vietnamese stories, uh, Guatemalan stories, and they never come together. No, they all have to come together, because we're all together on this planet living in one big ocean of tears, and we need to enter that swim in that ocean together take each other's hands and grieve together and that will bring profound healing so this poem is just about that uh, my wife kate and i have an adopted daughter in vietnam her name is nguyen thi nhoc nhoc um, means jade and she is a jade uh, she's on he, she's accompanied our group on in vietnam on some of our healing journeys and she said, well, she says to me, please keep bringing your veterans here to Vietnam so my country people and I can heal them with our love. All we want from the GIs is to keep coming here so we can heal them with our love. That's what we're asking for from us, except one thing, also help with their Agent Orange with things. They have a massive number and they don't have the resources to help them, but they're not blaming. They're just asking us to recognize it and help with the damage we cause. So uh, Nyok and I have been to My Lai together. And this poem is called Letter to My Daughter After Visiting My Lai. Okay, uh, there's a question for you, Miguel, after I read the poem. So letter to my daughter, Nyok, after visiting me life. Yesterday, we walked side by side and hand in hand through the petrified prints of the bare feet of fleeing mothers and children and the stomping combat boot boots of marauding GIs. We stood in the kitchen of ghosts. We hugged before the hats, shirts, canes, of those who can no longer use them. I felt such shame. I could no longer feel worthy to be your father. Mm. But all you did was wipe my tears and call me Bo. Bo means father in Vietnamese. All you did was wipe my tears and call me father. That hat, that cane, were worn by an old man who walked into your dreams last night. Terror in his eyes, last prayer on his lips. He came with the one who married him forever. The GI you saw beating, 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 his head, his face, his arms, his body. This morning, your own head screams with his pain. His eyes are behind your eyes. This morning, as my fingers 
try to massage your ache away. I see his wounds, his blood breaking through your gentle almond face. You cannot stand the pain of your grandfather or the long suffering of your country. I cannot stand. I cannot stand the pain of my daughter or the endless shame of my nation. Side by side, hand in hand, we carry this pain together. Side by side, incense between our palms, we bow as one before the altar of the dead. Beautiful, very powerful, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna answer Andrea's question. Um, I was born in Guatemala, actually, believe it or not. <laughs> Most people meet me, they go, you don't look like you're from Guatemala, but I am. My father was from Guatemala, my mother was from the United States. My father was a surgeon and he was doing a residency at a hospital in Jersey City. And my mother used to give him instruments in the operating, operating room. This is how they met. This is 1948, a long time ago. He would not live in the United States, so we went back, he, they went back to, he got married and went back to Guatemala. So I'm a total mutt. <laughs> uh, but she was she was Polish, you know, so there's a whole side of the family that, that's all Polish and we're a mixture of Maya Kiche and Spanish and whatever else is in there and who knows what. Because when you started studying studying the ancestry of of Iberia or the Iberian Peninsula from the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians and all the, the Romans to Greeks, you name it, you know, there's a whole the history there. The Muslim conquest in 780, all that stuff. So that's all. That's all in there, you know. So I had a vision one time. I went to Spain for the very first time in 1990 to work, or in 1989, I think. And I was thinking, oh, you, you grow up with La Madre Patria over there, you know. And I heard this voice in my head and, and said, "Usted no es de aquí. You're not from here. Usted es de allá." And literally, if you look at this pattern on my shirt, I felt the marrow in my bones. That's that's the pattern that was in my, and I, and I had a vision. That's what that that's what I saw. My bones were just like what you see in the shirt. And I realized, oh, I've been claimed by the land. The land has claimed me. So this is important here because through these teachings that that we're hearing from Vietnam, from Guatemala, the issue is that the earth is claiming us again as human beings that have forgotten what it is to be in relationship to the earth. We eat all the foods that we eat. All the minerals that make that come from the ground are now in our bones. The stones have become our bones, right? So now we are, there's a, there's a, we're, we're like this antenna, this mirror that starts to vibrating with the energy of the land. And this is what we have to pay to it, attention to. We are being re-indigenized in some form. And it's gonna take many generations to, to grow into that. But this is what we, have, what we have to consider. The recipe of what humanity is becoming, the transformation through love. People that have hated each other for centuries are, have to learn how to love each other because the children are falling in love and they don't want to do the craziness that the ancestors did with each other. You know, This is part of a much, much larger conversation. But this is really important to consider. And this is what the value of these teachings are that were given to us. And we're now seeing it, the transmission. We keep repeating the transmission right, in different formats, different configurations, looking at it from a different point of view, right? But the song of the earth has to be listened to through the fire, through the water, through the earth, and through the air. And this is what we're doing right now. This is the gift that our teachers gave, Umberto gave all the Vietnamese. This is the message, listen, really pay attention. Like, well, it's really important. What I haven't, I'll, I'll be explicit now, what's important is to really Go out and listen to the song of the earth, wherever you are. What the trees are saying, what the earth is saying, what the sky, what the wind is saying. Go sit and make fire and sit down in front of a fire and listen to the song of the fire. Right? So this is for your daughter, Ed, because uh, this is called, las, I'm going to read it in Spanish and English. Um, some, las maletas. Te vas a uno. ¿Y por qué están hechas las maletas? Porque soy un viajero. Y en cualquier momento tendré que irme no solo de esta ciudad, sino también de este mundo. Y de mi corazón, solo si tú abres la puerta. The suitcases. Are you leaving? Not yet. 
then why are you bags packed? Because I am a traveler. And at any moment, I will have to leave, not only from the city, but also from this world. And from my heart, only a few open the door. <laughs> mm. Oops, did, did, we, did, did we miss that? Was I totally muted on that? Or did, did we somehow? No. We I got you. it? OK, good. Yeah, we're OK. I think. Good. We're good. OK. So uh, I want to continue bringing the children in and also uh, bringing more of the women in to, the, to our stories. And I also want to bring uh, medical personnel, doctors and nurses who serve in the war zone uh, from both sides, from our side, from the other side, who went to try to heal and reduce the suffering, not to contribute to it. Uh, one nurse who went back to uh, Vietnam with us, uh, her name is Beth Marie Murphy. Uh, she lives in Canada now. In fact, she, she couldn't come back to this country. Uh, Vietnam became her country and she's been back there many, many times and she leads her own journeys there now, uh, but she couldn't come to the, home to the United States. She makes Canada her home uh, with many, several thousand other American veterans. Uh, Beth Marie was Uh, Beth Marie um, was a nurse on our hospital ship, the USS Sanctuary, which was uh, moored off, the, the, off Da Nang. And um, in addition to tending our wounded, she tended wounded Vietnamese uh, people, especially wounded Vietnamese children were brought to her boat uh, for, for medical treatment and healing and she be, she bonded deeply with a girl who had lost both of her legs in an American bombing. The girl's name was Mien. Uh, well this tells the story. Um, so this poem is called The American War Nurse Builds a Windy Tomb. Ah, Windy Tomb, the Vietnamese as we shared there's so many missing in action in Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese have a tradition. They honor the souls of the dead, always. And they honor uh, their, their loved ones in every family for a hundred years, for four generations. They have, uh, they have family altars, the most important uh, structure in every Vietnamese home, including the poorest ones for destitute families who live in the jungle under a plastic tarp. They've got an ancestor altar honoring the ancestors and staying connected to that lineage and feeling your ancestors with you is utterly important and is a real living experience for them. Uh, and when there isn't a body, um, so when somebody's been missing in action or somebody was lost at sea, um, they build what they call windy tombs, which are empty tombs so that the soul still has a place to come home. And they, pray at that tomb as if the body is actually there. It's not the body that's important. It's honoring the soul and giving it a home and letting it be at home back in, in the earth. So um, this, our nurse wanted to honor the lost child and to build her a windy tomb. So uh, the American war nurse builds a windy tomb and in her voice. My back is bowed from, uh, from decades of carrying the soul of the legless girl who became my patient, then my niece, as we flew colored kites in the wind off my ship. In dreams, my eyes are pink and swollen with the ocean of tears, both shed and withheld. Since the angry wound, our angry wounded called her VC child and her desperate parents snatched her back into the jungle. Today I carry one stone at a time. With each dripping tear, I recite her name. Gently I let her down off my back 
and give my lost niece this tomb for a home. Eight children tumble around my fractured legs to help me lay the last stones on her cairn. A single red dragonfly hovers in our wafting incense and a sweet breeze kisses my cheek with her name. For the Vietnamese, they're not gone. They're in the spirit world and we can maintain our connection with them. And in that light, a very quick story about my daughter Nhoc and also uh, my niece, Quinn. We're in the north in Hanoi and we rented, a, a hired a taxi to bring us to Nyok's uh, home village, which is about two hours outside of Hanoi. So their taxis are tiny, their roads are tiny, they are tiny. So I was in the back in the middle seat with Nyok on one side and Quinn on the other. And uh, they know English pretty well. And the Vietnamese youth, they're high school, college students, young adults. They've watched all of our Vietnam War movies. We haven't watched theirs. They've read our books. They listen to 60s music on the internet. And they say, oh, we speak really good English because we know all of your cool 60s songs. So there we are in the taxi cab with these two sweet, wonderful Vietnamese young women beside me, and they started to sing, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? I started to cry. And they looked at me, oh, Buckhead, Buckhead, Uncle Ed, why are you crying? And I said, because I used to sing that song. We used to sing that song in America during the war to try to stop the bombs from falling on you. And they just tickled me and giggled and said, but Bakhed, look. What, Quinn? What, Nyok? What do you want me to see? We're here. We're fine. The bombs aren't falling. And we're here together. No problem. Let it go. The children. Your turn, brother. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ed. So uh, let me see, Andrea wanted to know if uh, all these poems, are, yes, the poems I've been reading are in the Courtyard of the Moon, and Ed's poems are all, all in Coming Home from Me. I'll hold the book up again so you can take a look at it. Ed, you should hold your book up, yeah. So these poems are in these books, with the exception of the Fire poem. That's in the other anthology that I have. But uh, yes, and the Song of the Earth must be listened to. It's a very subtle and very beautiful song. So this is what I wanted to read, and uh, let me see. Los murciélagos y yo. Los murciélagos y yo esperábamos la llegada de la noche para jugar con las estrellas en el patio de la luna. The bats and I. The bats and I waited the arrival of the night to play with the stars in the courtyard of the moon. The bats and I awaited the arrival of the night to play with the stars in the courtyard of the moon. So that's why I decided to <laughs> sit with that for a while, let it breathe. So I think we, uh, uh, I wanna say thank you, Ed, for taking the time to share stories and poems. Or we, can, we can just chat. I think we have about five minutes or so left, you know? So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we need to shut down, but thank you to Miguel and thank you, Brian and Karen from Tia Chucha. Yeah. And Louise, who can't be here tonight, but thank you, bless you, we honor you. We hope you will be governor of California. <laughs> yes. yes, go on, Richard. Yeah, but that's yeah. I think it's important. We have to think about this, doing it a different way. I mean, I had a conversation with Luis. I did a reading at Tia Chucha's uh, in November, I think it was, and um, we were talking about the level of polemics that are out there in the culture right now, and we don't want to add to that. We want to change the level of discourse. We want to, uh, we want to foster inquiry, curiosity, you know. And uh, one of the stories I wanted to share when I was sun dancing, uh, what the second or third year we were getting ready to go into the arbor, the intercessor. You know, if you know anything about the sun dance, it's a very tough ceremony. But anyway, 
he said, your people, this is in 1985, 86, right? So this is the anniversary of the arrival of Columbus is looming. Columbus, blah, blah, blah. For, but for native peoples, it's a disaster. When you think about the millions of people that died due to the whatever happened with the arrival of the Europeans, mind you, certain Europeans, because there was Europeans here before the Spanish and the English and the French and the Dutch, right? And, the, and whatever else. When the Vikings came, it was very different from what I understand. But this is, these are all, you know, polem, uh, different points of discussion. But anyway, he said, your people could not do this with us. Talking about the ceremony, right? When they first came over 500 years ago, he said, on their behalf, you're doing it now. On their behalf. So this that we're doing here today is also prayer for the ancestors, right? Our, we don't want to live. We don't want our great grand. I have four grandchildren now. I don't want my great I don't want my great grandchildren to have to go through this kind of stuff. So I want to take it on. Let's figure out and invite the inquiry, the discourse. Left to our own devices, throw the politicians, cultural and religious leaders out the door. The first thing we would do is we would make shelter. And then we would make food and then we would feed each other. And this is what we need to learn how to do. Cook with each other's recipes. Another poem from Umberto says, Roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside which means that each single one of us has a direct connection to source, to spirit. So this is what we're doing, reclaiming our connection to source without uh, any inconvenience from an intermediary, right? Without any uh, clouding, any pollution of anything, right? Pollution begins in the mind. So we take all those things, all those markers out so that we can become human beings and then and in a larger community of beings. This is what we're doing through this discourse and this elegance. So. This is what I want to what I want to throw out there tonight. So, any any closing words for for our vast audience? <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, your closing words are and lessons are perfect. So, I'd like to read a closing poem to give one of the songs of the earth from Vietnam and how deeply we can listen to and connect with the earth. And they haven't lost that connection. Uh, so. As I've been sharing uh, my poems, so many are in first person and it's people speaking. This one is bamboo speaking to us. <laughs> and this is so many things we don't know about bamboo, but listen to the earth, listen to the waters, listen to the bamboo. And this is the bamboo's life. So this poem is called Bamboo Speaks. And we honor the earth, the Guatemalan earth, the Vietnamese earth, the entire planet that we love and are working to reconnect with in a healthy, loving way. So bamboo. From under the green waters of our tiny family pond, from beneath the whiskered catfish and beneath the golden ducks, I watched the moon cycle 13 times from full to empty to full again. In this still place, I grow hard and strong. Soon I will emerge. My family will eat with my chopsticks. Our daughter will play me as her flute and she will awaken the soul of the rice. Beautiful. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Tia Chucha, Brian and Karen. Thank you, Luis Rodriguez. And thank you all who came and attended. Thank you, Andrea and anybody else. If I'm Mark, I say, anyway, good night. We love you all dearly. And I guess this is it, right? So until the next time. Yes, until next time. Muchas we gracias. <laughs> Camarat new in Vietnamese. Thank you very, very much. Buenas noches, Maltios and Maya. Que duerman todos bien, que sueñe con los angelitos y las angelitas. Adiós. In la catch, a la catch. In la catch. <laughs> All right. You Good night, are everybody. Me, I am you. <laughs> Blessings. Good night. Uh